Hi folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiatoria. So <clears throat> I was um, recently put up a video comparing uh, what type of swords I might pick if I was going to fight in a one-on-one -on -one duel. Um, in a dueling scenario, I know not other people are going to get involved. Uh, it's like a pit fight, uh, so on and so forth. I'm sure lots of my viewers have seen this video by now. Um, and an interesting thing that came up in the comments to that video uh, was that people asked me uh, so uh, which would have the advantage out of say like a, uh, a basket hilt broadsword and a sabre or perhaps a side sword and a, a, a Chinese um, sword okay so such as a, a jam or something like that um, and one of the points I tried to make in, in the comments is that actually um, Swords as a whole, and this is the headline of this video, swords as a whole actually split down into relatively few different types, relatively few categories. So whilst we can talk about, uh, we can name hundreds of different types of sword, uh, you know, falchion, shamshir, uh, tulwa, kilik, uh, um, tashi, katana, wakasashi, longsword, bastard sword, basket hilt broadsword, backsword, sabre, uh, rapier, small sword, spadroon, shearing sword, and the list goes on and on. Um, in actual fact, many of those are so similar to each other in general use, uh, broadly speaking, they're so similar to each other, that actually they divide into relatively few categories. Okay, So for example, we have one-handed swords and two-handed swords, obviously you could fundamentally divide all swords in, into, into one-handed and two-handed and then in the middle a group that can be used one-handed or two-handed. Um, and equally there's curved swords and straight swords uh, and within the curved swords there are ones that curve forward and ones that curve backwards and some that have a, a double curve like a yatagam. Okay? Um, within straight swords there are some that are broad all the way up and there are some that are uh, tapering to a, to a point and more, more designed for thrusting. So you can start to split down the top categories into smaller categories. But by and large, I haven't, I haven't actually sat down and, and, and counted the number of categories that I consider swords in application, in other words, in use, to really break down into. But I think it's probably something like about eight categories, something like that, seven or eight categories, I would say. Um, and so, for example, um, I'll, I'll go. Uh, one of the first ones I mentioned was basket hilt, um, backsword, and um, saber. So this is one that sometimes gets compared. So if we have here. I have a, a basket hilted uh, Tudor period backsword. It's called a backsword because it has uh, one edge. It has a that was what they called the one one edged swords. And on the other hand, I have a 19th century sabre. So this is a 16th century style sword, and this is a 19th century style sword. However, fundamentally, they're actually not very different. They both have hand guards that protect the hand to some extent, okay? To, to a pretty decent extent. If we're talking globally across historical periods, both of these have roughly similar hand protection. Now the, the basket hilt, yes it is uh, more protective than the sabre hilt, it encloses more of the hand um, and is usually more robustly made, although that's not always the case. Um, in fact, in this case it might be true because this is a brass handguard and this is a steel handguard, but in many cases sabre handguards are very, very robust and made of steel. Um, You'll notice that the saber doesn't have a large pommel, and the backsword does have a large pommel. Okay. In actual fact, the balance of both swords is about the same. So the fact that this has a visibly a large pommel doesn't actually really make any difference to its use at all. Um, the balance of is both, both is about the same. You'll notice that the length of both is, in this case. <laughs> actually exactly the same and I promise you that is absolute chance because I didn't compare them before I started filming so that the length of each blade is the same you'll notice that whilst this saber is very slightly curved it is only slightly curved um, and that doesn't really make any perceptible difference to the uh, to the use of the sword um, either in its cutting or thrusting or parrying um, so the blades are actually very similar they're both fullered blades more or less straight they can both cut, they can both thrust, they're of a similar length, they're of a similar weight, and they're of a similar point of balance. So actually, I would use this sword in exactly the same way as I would use this sword. 
Now that's not to say that 16th century English swordsmanship is the same as 19th century English swordsmanship. There are differences because, of course, it was a different period, so the context changes. Um, this sword might have to fight against people using claymores, pikes, halberds, um, and it's pre-bayonet period, okay? Um, so it's more dealing with, this would have to fight against more medieval-ish weapons. Whereas this sword is more likely going to face other swords like it, or, or shorter versions, hangers, um, uh, cutlasses perhaps, and um, bayonets mounted on a musket or a rifle, okay? Um, and very occasionally in colonial warf warfare, it might have to face things like tulwars, um, sometimes axes, clubs, spears, and so, so on and so forth. However, despite the fact that they're from three centuries apart, okay, this is from, say, the middle of the 1500s, this is from the middle of the 1800s, so three centuries apart, they're actually fundamentally very, very similar swords. They've both got the same physical characteristics and they've both got hand protection. Okay? Now, if we compare, uh, for example, some people have said, how does a, a back sword or a basket help broadsword compare to a tulwar? Okay? Um, so here we go, this is a tulwar. How does it compare? Well, the first obvious difference is that the tulwar has a curved blade that is broader. Okay? And generally speaking, not always, but generally speaking, shorter. Tulwars tend to have usually about between 27 and 30 inches of blade. Um, European one-handed swords for quite a long period of time usually have 30 inches and above of blade. They're usually between 30 and 34 inch blades. So European swords tend to be a bit longer. Um, Tulwars are a bit shorter but they're broader and curved. The total weight is about the same. The point of balance on the tulwa is further out in general than on a European sword. So you'll notice the point of balance there is about seven inches away from the hand. European swords tend to be more like four or five inches. So in other words, this sword is much more specialized for cutting. Um, the things that characterize a sword that's specialized for cutting are usually, not always, but usually a broader blade um, with a point of balance that's a bit further from the hand. Okay. Generally speaking, if you want uh, point control, um, then the point of balance will be closer to the hand. And if we look at something like a small sword, which is utterly specialised for the thrust, the point of balance is very, very close to the hand indeed. Uh, something like a rapier, it's usually a little bit further out, usually a two, three inches, something like that, away from the hand, um, because it is a specialised thrusting sword, but you can still cut with it and you still want to have some cutting capacity with most rapiers. Um, and then when you get to something like a sabre or a back sword, it's usually about five inches from the hand. So, uh, a tulwa is utterly uh, specialised for the cut at the detriment of the thrust, more or less. Okay? And also, the other obvious difference is that it lacks proper hand protection. Uh, or at least, not proper hand protection, that's, uh, that's uh, not a good way to put it. It lacks uh, such uh, complete hand protection as something like a basket hilt or a sabre does. Okay. Now I should mention some tool worlds do actually have more, more complete, uh, more, um, more comprehensive hand protection. Some of them have a knuckle bow and some of them in fact have a form of basket guard but that's normally found on a, a straight Indian sword called a kanda um, that seem to have been more specifically cavalry weapons and they are incidentally often mounted with European broadsword blades uh, usually made in Germany. Um, so, the, the real difference between these two is, as I've mentioned, one is more uh, specialised to the cut. However, by and large, they're not actually hugely different. I could use this sword in almost the same style as I could use this sword. The main thing that would change how I would use the tulwar is the fact that I don't have very much hand protection. So, let's put the tulwar down for a second. Whereas in uh, backsword, the guard positions are often in these sort of positions out here, with the hand extended in front of my body, and I'm almost protecting my sword arm and sword hand with the hilt. Okay? It's generally speaking not safe to do that with a sword that doesn't have complete hand protection. If I hold the weapon out in front of me here, like this, with a tulwar, you'll notice my hand and sword arm are now very, very vulnerable because anybody can snipe my fingers or the back of my hand, which of course, if it disables my hand, it disables my weapon and, and I'm not going to survive for very long. Um, 
So generally speaking, swords with, uh, with less uh, protection on the hand are generally held back in positions that are ready to cut or ready to defend, but they're held usually away from the opponent until you're actually doing a physical action. Okay? However, going back to my previous point, actually when it comes to the defensive or the offensive action, they're not that different to the, to the backsword or the sabre. It really only changes the guard position that I use. If you actually look at the parries, the cuts, the thrusts, and the movement of the sword of this sort with less hand protection, be it a medieval sword or an Indian tulwa, or a Chinese sword or a, a Japanese sword, the actual defensive and offensive movements are very, very similar throughout periods and across countries. It's really only the guard positions, the positions that you initially hold the sword in, that really change based on hand protection. Okay? Now, <clears throat> in terms of the uh, cuts and thrusts of this sword, let's look at another European sword that you can compare with the tulwar, that being the cutlass. Okay? Here we have a European cutlass, and you'll notice the blade is now almost exactly the same length, it's almost exactly the same width, and incidentally, it's a very similar point of balance as well. And cutlasses, uh, particularly of the mid-19th century and earlier 19th century, were famed for their cutting ability, so much so that they were used in feats of arms, in demonstrations of skill, to cut bars of lead in what the exercise was known as lead cutting. And you cast a triangular bar of lead, usually about eight inches long, and you chop through it. And if you chop through it successfully, it shows that you've got a good cutting technique. Okay, lead being softer than steel, of course, so the steel blade goes through it without damaging the steel blade. Now, this cutlass, as you'll see, is very similar, actually, in characteristics to the tulwa. The only obvious big difference really being the big hand guard again. Okay, there we go. And I should, of course, mention, because I'm sure some people will ask, why didn't the tulwa have better hand protection? because it was used with a buckler or a shield. Okay? If a sword is developed predominantly to be used with a, with a shield or a buckler, it doesn't need big hand protection. As I showed in my recent sword and buckler video, the buckler protects the line to the hand, um, and even physically, directly protects the hand in cutting and thrusting and parrying. So, um, quite simply, if the majority of the people who use a weapon also use it with a buckler or a shield, there's very little impetus to evolve a hand guard. It's only really in periods where the sword is a very secondary weapon, where their primary weapon, for example, this is a cutlass used by a sailor. Um, sailors predominantly, <laughs> their main weapon is their ship. Okay, they're manning a ship, um, they're firing cannons, they're manning the rigging and so on and so forth. And if they have to fight, they can't, carry, uh, they can't be carrying a buckler or a shield around. They're going to have to fight with a sword alone. Or in some cases, in desperate cases, perhaps a boarding axe or a boarding pike or a, uh, um, one of those wooden pins um, or such like. But this was the, the sailor's main hand weapon and it was their only hand weapon. So you need the hand protection on it because they're only going to be carrying this by, them, by itself. Okay? And obviously they don't have gauntlets, they don't have hand protection. Equally, the... Uh, Cavalry sabre of the um, 17th, 18th, 19th centuries, the cavalrymen by that time were not using shields. Shields were seen as more or less pointless uh, because, of course, it's the age of gunpowder and anybody can shoot a bullet straight through most shields. There were bulletproof shields, but <laughs> by and large, they were very heavy and used in siege warfare. Uh, you can't generally ride around on a horse carrying a bulletproof shield, So, um, despite what Captain America might do. Um, so. Um, they didn't carry shields anymore, and in fact they used their offhand for controlling the reins of the horse better and for operating their own guns, pistols usually, sometimes carbines. Okay? So, <clears throat> when you've got a soldier whose uh, primary weapon is essentially a gun, there, doesn't, there isn't much point, uh, certainly in Europe, there wasn't seen much point in also carrying a shield. And if you don't have a shield, you need hand protection for your sword. Quite simple as that. Okay, so, um, but by and large, these aren't hugely different weapons, except for the hand protection. They both cut about the same, they both thrust, thrust about the same, they can both parry in the same ways, they both have blades made of steel that are single edged and, and get very similar characteristics. So, really, if you took the hilt off a cutlass and uh, put the blade on a tulwa, uh, you'd end up with a tulwa. You know, and and the, this tulwa. Um, 
is actually has a British made blade and it was actually quite common in India to get British and German made blades and mount them on Tulwar hilts. So they're not greatly different weapons, they've just got a different hilt style. Now, if we go to something wildly different, or what seems wildly different here, this is a huge great sort of machete thing. Uh, it's British made, probably for the African market, 19th century antique, and it kind of looks like some kind of fantasy weapon almost, but it's a real, uh, it's an agricultural tool, but of course in uh, troubles in parts of, <laughs> parts of Africa over the years and, and South America and places like this, machetes or large agricultural tools have been used as weapons. And fundamentally this is not very different um, from certain types of medieval and ancient weapons that have been used. I should also mention this particular weapon has the edge on this side, many of them have the edge on the inside. Um, so, so the, sorry, outside this has the edge on. Okay, So this is kind of like a giant falchion or messer type thing. Um, what's the difference between this and something like this? Well, fundamentally it's, it's fatter, it's broader, uh, it's flatter, thinner in the blade, and of course it is shorter. And the point of balance is very much designed for chopping um, vegetation. It's not really designed for fighting with, so it will give an almighty chop but it's not very, it's not particularly quick uh, and nimble at defending with. Okay, it's not too bad because it's it's fairly short. If it was much longer, it'd be completely unmanageable, and that is why it is short, incidentally. Um, so, but fundamentally, again, it's it's a weapon that can cut. This one cannot thrust because of the shape of the blade, but many machetes can thrust, of course. Um, and um, it's not. It's not hugely different to many types of sword that are out there. Okay, so again, we we haven't got that many categories now. If I go to uh, two types of longsword, okay, so here's one longsword, here's another longsword. Is there much difference? There's one's a bit longer. They've got very similar hand protection on them. Uh, this one's broader and a bit heavier. This one's narrower and a bit more nimble and longer. There isn't really uh, the the difference between them is in detail, okay? And yes, sometimes the devil can be in the detail, but in this case, they're essentially the same weapon. There are two there are two long swords of a similar type. Um, however, there are long swords that are uh, much broader bladed all the way along, like an oak shot type 12 or 13, um, and these, generally speaking. I would say, generally speaking, earlier types, but in fact that type did come back again in the 15th century, and particularly in the late 15th century. So it was used throughout a, a, a wide period. But uh, broader, more cutting looking blades with a more spatulate point. Now clearly this type of sword is more or less specialised for dealing with armoured opponents, because what they've done is they've sacrificed some cutting ability, which is not the best cutting sword in the world, um, for improved nimbleness and thrusting ability, and they've made a very stiff blade that will thrust very powerfully through resist resistive materials, like uh, padded armour underneath um, steel armour, and mail as well, bursting mail links. So this is a specialised weapon for the time that it was uh, used in. Um, however, the broader, longer type of longsword can be used in much the same way. If I'm fighting in an unarmoured fight, I could use this sword, or I could use an earlier Oakshot Type 12 sword with a broader blade. And essentially I can still I can still move it in the same way. They've got a similar weight, similar point of balance. I use the same guard positions, the same cuts, the same types of thrust. Um, I can obviously cut and thrust with the blade. Um, they've got same type of hilts. So fundamentally it's the same kind of sword. And when people ask, um, and this was particularly in the comments of my last video, they ask uh, how would you rate the Chinese Jan or uh, a Dao or um, certain other types of uh, you know, Korean swords or um, other types of sword, Kaskara, African swords you know, for example. Um, swords from other places around the world, how would they fit into this? <coughs> and my, my basic point, my basic answer is that actually most types of swords are only split into about seven categories. I mean, the Chinese Jan, for example, is essentially, I would say, everything the same as I said for the medieval arming sword. 
It hasn't got much hand protection, but it's, very, it's pretty good at cutting and thrusting. It's a nimble sword, it's relatively light. Um, to all practical purposes, there's no real difference between a Chinese Jan of the same length as an arming sword uh, and the arming sword. In actual fact, most Chinese swords, that, uh, most antique Chinese swords that I've seen tend to be shorter than European swords. I don't know why that is. Um, maybe steel was more valuable commodity, or I, d I just don't know. I've noticed that in lots of uh, modern uh, replicas of Chinese weapons and in modern martial arts films, uh, Chinese films particularly, um, the, the swords seem to be longer than the antique examples show. But that's, uh, that's something I'll talk about in a, in a different video. But essentially there's no, there's no real notable difference between a Chinese um, one-handed sword of the straight type, the Jan, and, and uh, a medieval arming sword. Or indeed with a, an African Cascara, which again is a type of one-handed cut and thrust sword of a similar length and a similar balance. It's not, it's not notably different. And people equally go, well, what, you know, what about, how would you choose between a, a side sword and a sabre? Well, is there really much of a difference? It depends on the sabre. Some sabres are very curved, some are very broad. But this type, this type of sabre, for example, is not notably different to a side sword. It has hand protection, it has a cut and thrust blade, it weighs about two pounds, and it has a point of balance about five inches from the hand. It's... In all physical ways, this is essentially very similar to a, to a um, side sword. And if we take a uh, side sword treatise like Morozzo, for example, from 1536, I could do everything in Morozzo's side sword using this sabre. Equally, I could take a 16th century side sword and use it perfectly for 19th century sabre. They are, to all intents and purposes, the same sword. They, they might have some physical differences, they might look a bit different, but they're a similar length, similar weight, similar balance, they can both cut and thrust and they both have hand protection. So really when you're analysing differences between swords, it really only comes down to a few factors to consider. Um, is the sword balanced cut and thrust or is it more specialised for cutting, like a tulwar or a, maybe a falchion, or is it more specialised for thrusting? like a rapier or a small sword. Uh, does it have hand protection? Does it have uh, some hand protection? Does it have a lot of hand protection? Is that hand protection restrictive in some way? Um, and these are the kind of things to consider. Don't get so fixated on the fact that one sword might superficially look very different to another sword, but when you actually analyse it in terms of length, weight, point of balance, uh, and cut and thrust relative ability, Actually, you might find that two swords that look quite different are essentially the same, or in the same category. Okay, I hope that's of some use and maybe helps you think about different weapons in a slightly different way than just looking at them as a silhouette on a page. Cheers!